Well, good morning. It's uh, my great pleasure to uh, welcome Professor George Fletcher from Columbia University in New York City to uh, join us uh, today. Uh, Professor Fletcher is one of the most uh, interesting and dynamic thinkers that, uh, that I have encountered. I first met Professor Fletcher in uh, his criminal theory class at Columbia in 1994. Professor Fletcher brings a diversity of perspective to the study of law and international criminal law, the likes of which you'll seldom encounter uh, from, uh, from any other thinker. Professor Fletcher speaks uh, over ten languages. He's published over ten books, uh, books in a variety of languages, and when Professor Fletcher publishes a book uh, in another language, he doesn't just translate into the target language for the target audience. He reworks the book entirely to take account of the subtle nuances in uh, theory and in doctrine of the legal system of the, uh, the target audience. Professor Fletcher's uh, diversity of perspective is also reflected in the fact that uh, he started his academic career as a leading authority on torts, uh, then uh, developed a highly sophisticated and uh, theorized uh, approach to comparative criminal law, criminal law of the old Soviet system, France and Germany in particular. Professor Fletcher also holds academic appointments in Jerusalem uh, and uh, several uh, uh, appointments in Germany. Uh, Professor Fletcher's classics include Rethinking Criminal Law, the uh, definitive comparative study of, uh, of uh, criminal law from a highly theorized perspective. Uh, uh, some of his more recent uh, books include Basic Concepts of Legal Thought and Basic Concepts of Criminal Law, wonderful primers I recommend for, uh, for students. Our Secret Constitution, How Lincoln Redefined American Democracy in 2001. Romantics at War, Glory and Guilt in the Age of Terrorism, published in 2002, a critical approach to the uh, then nascent policies of the Bush administration uh, in respecting the war on terror, and American Law in a Global Context, uh, which is a wonderful uh, academic text for uh, students of American law from other countries. Professor Fletcher has three relatively new books, or very new books, I should say, three in the last 16 months or so. The Grammar of Criminal Law, which is a new study of uh, comparative criminal law. Tort Liability for Human Rights Abuses, in which Professor Fletcher explores the tort alternative to the uh, war, use of force, uh, model and the criminal law model in the war on terrorism. And the book that uh, he will be discussing today, Defending Humanity, When Force is Justified and Why, uh, uh, published in March of this year. Please join me in a uh, warm welcome for Professor George P. Fletcher. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, William Merkel. I actually have tried. I always called uh, William Merkel by the name Merkel, and he's always stuck, and it's hard for me to change. And he's recently given me permission to continue with, with this practice. So anyway, I'm very delighted to be here it's, uh, to address uh, such a distinguished audience. I look forward to your questions. I understand that we have about 45 minutes, so I will speak for about 30 minutes, and then I would like to take your questions. Uh, I'm stimulated to uh, talk about this book, Defending Humanity, When Force is Justified and Why, uh, because I recently read a very negative review by a distinguished professor of international law, uh, Joram Dinstein, in Tel Aviv. I think that the motive uh, for this review was probably that I forgot to meet uh, Professor Dinstein for a luncheon appointment that we once had. But if we leave motives aside, I think that it's very important that I consider uh, some of his arguments, well, at least the ones that are not too uh, nasty. Um, and also, it's quite interesting for me uh, as a, basically an outsider to the field of international law to encounter the way people think about it from the inside. Um, because I think in all of our fields, we do have uh, insiders who protect their territory, and we have poachers like me who actually respect no boundaries and uh, invade other fields at will. 
And sometimes the people who are protecting their own turf um, are not too happy about this. One thing I've discovered, though, from writing in many different fields, and this is advice to some young, young academics here, um, that if you get identified with a field, people will always think of you as that person, no matter what else you write. I tried to write in constitutional law, but nobody in constitutional law would take me seriously. Oh, what are, you're a criminal lawyer, right? What are you doing writing about Lincoln and the, and the Civil War? I mean, that's not your business. And similarly, I think here the argument for uh, the book, Defending Humanity, is I try a novel approach uh, to the analysis of self-defense in international law by using two methods that I think have been basically ignored in the literature. One method is to do a comparative study of the various uh, language uh, translations of the UN Charter and to see whether it makes a difference whether you're talking about Article 51 which recognizes self-defense whether you're talking about it in English and French or Spanish or Russian in Arabic or Chinese not that I read all of those languages but some of them I do and I can easily check and I find this is like a, what to do in the middle of the night when I can't sleep I check translations to see what they might tell me and I find it actually that sometimes the world of translation can tell you quite a lot. Well, one thing we have to recognize about the field of international law, and I think I say this to my great regret, the field of international law began, so far as I know, in Latin with Grotius, and then I think that the French language dominated the field for several centuries. But for at least a century, I think the English language has been dominant. And uh, the field, uh, the literature is written in English, and the scholars in the field read the literature in English. This means that the English language carries with it a very strong bias about the interpretation of various key provisions. And this is notably true in the definition of self-defense in Article 51.